so I've constructed different models of trafficking. And one of them I call the supermarket model, which is the mass movement that comes across the US border from Mexico to the United States. The natural resource model, which you explained, that comes out of the former Soviet Union. The trade and development model, the pimp model, and Nigerian and West African traffic. And I think that in Iceland, you have several of these based on reports of who your trafficking victims are. So let me go into this. The, the supermarket model, which is not your model of trafficking, but the most common that we have in the United States, is one in which business and profits are made by moving large numbers of people at low cost. The problem comes that when you're moving large numbers of people, you think about them as a supermarket. You've got to move many of them. Therefore, each person does not cost much. You're not making much from each person, and therefore you can afford to lose people. And that's why we have many deaths of people coming across the U.S. border into the southern parts of the United States, southwest particularly, where we have deserts, and they die of of absence of water or of absence of food because the traffickers see them as disposable. <coughs> Unfortunately, this trade is linked to the trade in drugs and arms and, and the corruption that is increasingly developing along the U.S.-Mexican border on our side as well as on the Mexican side. And the, most of this is for labor trafficking, for individuals who are exploited in the construction sector, in the agricultural sector in the United States, but it's also providing the women that are trafficked in the case that I just mentioned in um, the Latino brothels outside of Washington, D.C. Um, the natural resource model is one that comes out of the former Soviet Union. And just yesterday, as I was hearing um, Russian spoken in my hotel as the women were cleaning the rooms, I thought one needs to be very careful to make sure that there's not exploitation in the labor sector. Because the attitude of the traffickers of, of women and also sometimes of, of men who are trafficked is the same as the way the Russian economy works. Russians sell off oil and gas and timber to wholesalers. They don't refine this. And they don't care about the future. If they have oil, gas, forests for the future. Totally different view than your society, which thinks about environment and conservation. And they view women the same way. The fact that they're having a demographic crisis is the only reason that the, that the legislature finally adopted a law on human trafficking because they realized that if so many women were trafficked, they wouldn't have future citizens. And so they sell off the women to other traffickers, often from Eastern Europe, often in Turkey, because unlike the Chinese, who I'll talk about, who run an integrated business, they're selling off women like a wholesale commodity, and once you have that, and women are sold and resold, there are more violations of human rights. And the profits don't improve the economy. They're moved to offshore locales where they're dissipated. Contrast that with the Chinese model. And I know there have been some Chinese, not many, but a few trafficked here to Iceland. Um, this is a totally different business model. Just as China has grown to be the second largest economy in the world through its trade. Its illicit trade also supports the economy. And unfortunately, there are, like in Russia, there are high-level government officials who are involved and help facilitate this illicit trade. In one analysis that was done by seizing the financial records of a Chinese smuggling operation in the, in the United States, 
one network alone was a $60 million operation. And it's interesting, and I write about this in my book, that who facilitated this was a Harvard-educated lawyer. So this corruption is not just state corruption, it's the corruption of professionals that help facilitate this. Victims are known, the business was integrated from recruitment in China to exploitation in the United States, and the money went back to China to foster <coughs> economic development. So illicit trade behaved the same way as legitimate trade. We also have, unfortunately, a problem that we have not recognized until recently, is that most of our sex trafficking in the United States is not of women imported from other countries, but is exploitation of domestic minors. Young girls, often of 12 or 13, who, uh, without the social protections that you know in a country like Iceland and the social welfare countries of Western Europe, become much more vulnerable to exploitation. And this, what I call the pimp model, is like our society before the financial crisis. Lots of show of wealth by the traffickers and very little savings. And unfortunately, it has a very high mortality rate in that the victims often die, according to the data that's been collected, after seven years of drug overdose, doses, suicide, homicides by their own clients. And the profits, there's nothing to show for it. The West African model, which you've seen here, is primarily from Africa to Western Europe, primarily for sexual exploitation. We've had some cases of trafficking for domestic servitude in the United States, but this problem that you see so strongly in Italy, you've seen it in Sweden, you've seen it in Norway, um, is much more pronounced from Africa to Western Europe. And it is also linked to the drug trade. Some of the sources of the women are the same areas in which you have the major traffickers of the, of the drug trade in Africa. And what is the problem is that it combines sophisticated forms of human trafficking. Just like you have <coughs> internet scams out of Nigeria, you have this human trafficking facilitated by computers, but also the victims have voodoo spells put on them so that they will comply with their traffickers. And the profits are returned back to West Africa, but they're also transferred into the illicit trade, such as drugs. <coughs> 